Hello, everybody. I am just delighted that you are here with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, making time for this session and for joining us tomorrow and Wednesday as well. Um, I think many of you know that I, um, I personally feel very passionate about advocacy work because I fundamentally believe that the voices of people with vision loss and other disabilities are just foundationally important to, uh, to advocacy, to crafting policy and laws that create greater inclusion and greater equity, and that we as people with vision loss bring such valuable experience through the, our day-to-day -day lives, experiences that are unique to us, and that as we tell our stories and ask for what would be helpful for us, we actually open the door to greater inclusion for other groups as well, other people with disabilities, our elders, our children in our communities, and you know the average um, individual. So your work as advocates is, is just so critical because we, while we do a lot of work on the policy level, your work in your local communities and your work with your local um, and state lawmakers really makes a difference. So thank you for prioritizing this and joining us today. Erin, we can go to the next slide. So uh, for a reminder for everyone, the mission of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired is to promote the dignity and empowerment of people throughout the state of Wisconsin who live with vision loss. And our guiding values are inclusivity, integrity, and uncompromising respect. Next slide. I'm so proud that the council turns 70 years old. This year, we were formed in 1952 by uh, groups of folks who lived with blindness and vision impairment, um, who saw the benefit of coming together knowing that many voices were stronger than individual voices. And that sense of collaboration uh, guides our work to this day. We know that we can strengthen when we, um, when we join with you all, when we join in other coalitions and advisory committees and other tools and groups that, that really allow us to elevate our message. So 70 year anniversary, you know, if you haven't been to our YouTube channel yet, I'd invite you to go there. There's a really lovely anniversary video that you can uh, take a listen to. It's all audio described and learn a little bit more about the history of the council. To this day, our board um, is governed, we're governed by folks with vision impairment. That's the primary population of folks on our board of directors. And many of our executive directors, including me, have been folks who live with vision impairment. And again, that's really critical because we know firsthand the needs, the experiences, the challenges, the barriers, and the possibilities that we bring as folks with vision impairment. And about half of our staff are folks with uh, vision loss as well. And then among our sighted board members and our sighted staff, they are outstanding allies in the work that we do. Erin, you can go ahead. Our primary work um, is threefold. So I often think about this as like three pillars that really hold up a, a, strong, um, a strong building or three legs of a stool that give it a lot of um, stability. So the first is advocacy. And we start there because our original work in 1952 was around advocacy, influencing the state legislature, the state agencies, and the governor to really consider, actively consider the needs of people living with vision loss in our lawmaking. And that um, you know, remains to this day. We also uh, do education work, both 
front facing with folks with vision impairment and their families, because there's a lot to learn as we navigate vision loss, especially for folks experiencing vision loss later in life. So learning more about um, eye conditions, for example, or what to expect as vision changes or learning the skills of how to live well with vision loss. And then we do education efforts that um, are facing the general public because we know uh, firsthand, many of us, that there's a lot of bias and misunderstanding in the general public yet about those of us living with vision loss. So a lot of our work is trying to break down some of those biases and those barriers to create easier access in employment and um, in community for people living with vision loss. And then our last um, leg of the stool or pillar is providing vision services. And we do that in a number of different ways. Many of you might be familiar with the Sharper Vision Store. We have an online and brick and mortar um, store and we have items that range from bump dots to higher end um, ACC, uh, CCTVs to really have accessible tools and adaptive equipment available so that we can do the activities of daily living, like cooking, like managing our own health care, like engaging in games, like playing cards and continuing to read either with magnification or with speech. Um, we also provide free white canes to any Wisconsin resident living with vision loss, including our children, um, because we see the white cane as such an important tool of independence, both for orientation, making our way safely around our communities, and for um, mobility, and also for identification. You know, sometimes I know folks are a little nervous about carrying a white cane. And for me personally, carrying a white cane and having folks in my community know that I'm living with vision loss has been incredibly empowering. We also provide um, access technology training and that can be done remotely. So whether you're in Rhinelander or you're in Mil you know, Milwaukee or you're in um, the Southern uh, Southwestern part of the state, maybe Platteville, we, you can remote connect with us for that instruction or do it at our council offices. We do in-home vision rehabilitation, so really helping folks to live well and to be able to stay in our homes as long as possible, safely and comfortably. And then low vision evaluations. How do we best use the functional vision that we have to, um, to live full and vibrant lives and safe lives? So um, yeah, so just if you're not super familiar with the work that we do at the council and particularly around our vision services, I'd invite you to visit our website at wcblind.org to learn more. And we can transition. The council established uh, legislative and advocacy priorities about six years ago that guide our work. And these priorities range from um, guiding the uh, guide, guiding policy with our very littlest Wisconsinites all the way through our elder Wisconsinites and working age folks too. Um, they range from accessibility and civil rights, education, employment, health care, and long-term care and transportation. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about each one of these with some of our most current work in that area. How we decide to take action for any of our advocacy priorities is driven by what we're experiencing, what we're observing as people with vision loss, what we're hearing from all of you through the stories you share with us, maybe in a vision services appointment or when you send in an email or when you share a story during um, our low vision support group or when we do an advocacy survey. We're also always looking for opportunities um, to work with state agencies on issues that you know, we might share in common or have common interest with, or finding legislators who care about our issues to move them forward. Additionally, we're also paying attention to things that could be um, challenges or barriers or threats to those of us with vision impairment. And there's often legislation that's been introduced 
um, it, for, it, for example, in this session that put some pretty significant prohibitions on voting for many of us with vision loss and, uh, and other disabilities. And so we were in advocating against those bills. So um, you know, we're guided by what our opportunities are and what the concerns or threats are. So when we think about accessibility and civil rights, some of our current work focuses on accessibility of public state websites. While many private websites have accessibility issues, we're more limited in our ability to influence those because they're private businesses. We can have influence in uh, state-owned websites many of which uh, you might use on a regular basis. You know, during the uh, earlier stages of the pandemic, when we needed to get uh, access to testing sites, you know, we often needed to jump on to the Department of Health Services website or our local health department website. When it came time to sign up for vaccines, we needed, again, to get on those websites. When we need to register to vote, um, we need to go onto a website. If any of you needed to apply for unemployment um, benefits during the pandemic, you hopped onto a state website. You know, when we need to um, learn more about renewing our state ID, we hop onto a state website. And sometimes those websites are very accessible and sometimes they're very inaccessible. So we have been working with the Department of Administration to increase the accessibility of state websites. And I'm so excited that we'll have a visitor from DOA with us on Thursday to continue that discussion. So you please join us Thursday to look at the accessibility of state websites. Additionally, in accessibility in civil rights, we have spent uh, a lot of time working to protect our rights as voters with vision loss to be able to vote. Voting is challenging for people uh, with disabilities and people with vision loss because of transportation, because of access issues to the uh, voting equipment, because we don't have an accessible absentee ballot in the state. So uh, we have been working to try to introduce a bill for an accessible absentee ballot that could be emailed and screen read, screen reader read and filled out. We've also been working to stop um, legislation that would have put severe limits on our rights. In the field of education, we are very concerned about um, our littlest Wisconsinites getting access to a solid education and making sure that they have access to learning Braille, to um, learning access technology, to having uh, orientation and mobility instruction, and to being able to work with highly qualified teachers of the visually impaired. And that requires money. So we're often advocating for increases in uh, the K-12 budget to uh, make sure that schools are allocating appropriate resources for kids with vision impairment. On the employment side, uh, we know that employment is uh, still a huge barrier for those of us with vision loss with 70% of us still experiencing unemployment. So uh, a lot of work to advocate for increased funding for DVR, uh, for integrated employment opportunities um, so that the doors, more doors can open for people with vision impairment. Healthcare and long-term care, the Office for the Blind and Visually Impaired is housed at the Department of Health Services. And that is such an important office because it provides in-home rehabilitation services to any adult who needs them and requests them free of charge. And it's funded by both the federal government and the state government. And we have not seen funding increases for that office for at least a decade. And in this state of inflation, that means there's actually less money to do the important work. And the number of those of us living with vision impairment continues to increase. So I just got some exciting news today, which I can't share yet, um, but um, uh, some of our advocacy efforts in that area likely coming to, um, to, to fr some fruition. 
The Department of Health Services also works with our littlest uh, folks. And so we've been working with Vision Forward to try to have a registry bill passed so that when a little one is born with vision impairment, they can, can get connected to vital services. And our end goal is also to make sure that people can live well in their homes as long as possible. Our last priority area is transportation. And gosh, it's a biggie because transportation links everything. You know, it gets us to work. It gets us to doctor's appointments. It gets us to see family and friends. It gets us to the grocery store and other community services. And Wisconsin has one of the most, um, uh, I was going to say broken, but that's quite not quite the right word, but it's one of the most disconnected transportation systems in the country. So it's very hard to get from here to there, as we all well know. And so we have been doing a great deal of work with the Department of Transportation and other state agencies to continue to remove some of those significant barriers to transportation. And we can go to the next slide. You were sent um, via email uh, last night, and we'll make sure that you get it again. And I know Kathleen put it in the chat, a link to our webpage under the advocacy tab to all of our advocacy priority documents. And if you have, and they're all screen reader accessible, um, so it should be um, very easy to access. I'd highly recommend that you take some time over the next couple of weeks to read those. They talk about the issue, then they give some very, we give some very concrete information about what we're hoping for from the state budget, what we hope for from the legislature, and then things we're asking policymakers within state agencies to do. So when you meet with your legislator, you can be very concrete and specific about the actions you would like to take. And again, the more they get consistent messages from constituents, the more likely they are to take positive action. And we can go forward. So we um, wanna paint a little bit of the landscape of um, our government, because I think that context is super helpful for knowing um, you know, kind of the lay of the land and what it means to do this advocacy work. So in Wisconsin, like all other states, we have three branches of government. We have, um, we have an executive branch, which is where the governor and lieutenant governor reside. We have a legislative branch, which is where the assembly and the Senate reside. And then we have a judicial, which at the very top of that judicial branch is the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Most of our interactions as advocates in, within the council are with the governor's office and with the legislature. We don't have a lot of interactions um, with the court system. And as you might remember, Wisconsin has divided government. So our governor um, and lieutenant governor are representatives of the Democratic Party. And in the state assembly and the state Senate, we have Republican majorities. So that makes our work very interesting because um, we might um, struggle to get attention from uh, legislators in the Senate or the assembly on our issues, while the gov governor might be very sympathetic, or maybe we have a bill introduced in the Senate or assembly that has some interest, but then is less interesting to the governor. So getting, um, getting things done can prove perplexing, though things that are positive are happening. So we just finished um, our uh, um, session for the 21-22 um, year. So legislators have gone home. They've gone back to their districts because they'll be campaigning. And Erin will tell you more about that in just a few minutes. So any bills that did not pass the Assembly and Senate both before the Assembly and Senate adjourned are now considered dead. So um, there will be no more um, lawmaking that happens in Wisconsin for the rest of this year. The next time that we move into a lawmaking period will be January of 2023. Um, during this period, the governor has vetoed um, over 119 bills to date. He still has some that he needs to take action on yet. Um, and even though that seems like a lot of vetoes, this uh, session 
has been actually more productive um, and there's been more um, cross party work than there was in the previous session, 2019 and 2020. So this year, the governor signed 267 bills into law. And in the previous session, he only signed 186 into law. It's been very busy in the assembly as well. Nearly 1,200 um, bills were introduced this session compared to 1,000 in the previous session. And the Senate has been very busy as well. They introduced 1,100 bills this session compared to just about 930 bills in 2019, 2020. So those are very busy uh, lawmaking bodies and we can go forward. Throughout this last uh, year and a half, there have been things that we have been watching um, very closely and advocating on um, either for or against. So a couple of things that were signed into law is um, um, the ability for the Department of Public Instruction to investigate um, the um, uh, sustainability and possibility of setting up ABLE accounts. We also saw just signed uh, Friday, I think, uh, Alliance Club eyeglasses bill. And what this bill would do, as you, as you know, the Alliance Clubs often collect used eyeglasses and refurbish them and then distribute them to folks living with you know, few economic means, both in the United States and, um, and in other countries. And this bill exempts the Lions Clubs from, um, from um, any damages. It, it gives them that exemption. Um, so the, those were both signed by the governor recently. And we can go forward. The governor vetoed um, many things, and um, among them was a bill that we did support um, that would have put in protections for indefinitely confined voters. An indefinitely confined voter is someone who requests that their ballot, absentee ballot, be sent to them automatically because getting to the polls to vote is a hardship, particularly due to disability, uh, infirmity, or age or health condition. And um, that has been a provision that many lawmakers wanted to severely limit um, during this, this session and going forward. We worked very hard with Senator Kathy Bernier of the uh, Chippewa Falls area to build a bill that protected the rights of indefinitely confined voters, gave that better definition um, so that those voters who really need that provision can be guaranteed it. That bill did not um, pass the governor, though he vetoed it. So we will need to be doing work on that again when we come back in 2023 so that we can protect our indefinitely confined voters. Um, the governor did veto many um, voting bills that would have negative impacts on folks with disabilities, including um, provisions to absentee voting. And we can go forward. Things that did not pass before the session was over, um, I'll name a couple of these. And you know, it's, sometimes it's a bummer. Yeah, it is a bummer when things don't pass, but it's not, a, it's not like a failure because it's often paving the way forward um, next time we can get a jump start on things. And also it reveals often things that need to be um, taken care of. It gives us information about what other uh, policies and laws do we need to, to have changed. So the first one is Steve's law. So very briefly, Steve Johnson was a board member with the council for many years. Um, sadly, he passed away in 2019. Those of you who knew Steve knew he was an avid outdoors person, hunter, fisher. And one time as Steve was trying to renew one of his hunting licenses, he discovered that the DNR's Go Wild system, which is their purchasing platform for getting your hunting and fishing licenses, you couldn't set up an account if you did not have a driver's license. You could still buy um, a hunting license using your state ID, but you couldn't set up an account that housed your information. And he brought that to our attention and that was concerning because it's um, a disparity that the ID um, can't be used for the same things that the driver's license can. So a bill was introduced 
to uh, make the um, Go Wild system accessible for somebody with a state ID um, so that we had ID parity. Um, the bill didn't advance all the way through. It just kind of got hung up. People weren't really opposed to the bill, but there were just other things that they saw as higher priority. So while it got a public hearing, it didn't make it through both houses to get to the governor's desk. But it, we have that bill language ready to go for next time. So when we come back to lawmaking again, we can you know, start a little further ahead. The other thing that that bill really helped us to identify is, wow, if this happened with the DNR, where are other situations where the driver's license can be used, but the ID can't? That's unfair. So um, how do we establish that, um, that fairness? So we have reached out to the Wisconsin Department of Transportation to ask them to do an audit to help highlight places where that might be existing so we can work on creating ID parity or equality. If you know and experience a situation where someone wouldn't accept your state ID um, because they only accept driver's licenses, um, you know, that's a good thing for us to know about so we can see if there's advocacy work we can do there. I mentioned earlier that um, Vision Forward took the lead on establishing a registry. So when a baby um, or, uh, is born or a young child is identified as having a significant vision impairment, that the family um, can get information and get connected with uh, highly trained vision services professionals so that they can um, get information about the child's vision impairment maybe start doing some therapies right away. Some vision impairments can be corrected soon after birth. And there's also such critical learning about language and relationship and social interactions that happens very early in life and that are very vision dependent. So teaching the little ones and the parents other strategies for building those skills so that we get our littlest folks on the road to success. So that registry would connect those families with um, those qualified service providers. Again, there was interest in that bill. It had a public hearing, um, but it did not advance through um, the uh, houses to make it to the governor's desk. But it has opened up important conversations with the Department of Health Services, and we have a jump start on that bill for the next legislative session. And the last one um, focused on pedestrian safety. So those of us who use a white cane or use a uh, service animal know that the white cane law may um, recall, requires a driver to stop within 20 feet of us when we are in the roadway. Um, this piece of legislation would have, um, if it had passed, um, make it so that uh, drivers need to stop for any pedestrian, whether or not they're carrying a white cane. Um, when they're in the roadway. And that would have been really fantastic because we know that many folks with vision impairment don't carry white canes. Um, and so, but really do are at risk and vulnerable when crossing the street. So our children, so are our elders, so are other folks that simply need a longer time to get across the street. So that work again is, um, you know, we've got the groundwork for it so we can pick it back up in the next legislative session. Um, we can go to the next one, Erin. So I'm going to, at this point, um, make a transition and um, turn the reins over to Erin Fabrizius. Um, Erin and Michael, uh, both with Blumenfeld and Associates, are key partners for the council in our advocacy work. So they are both public liaisons. So they are in the Capitol, in the governor's office, working with state legislators, helping us to know who is a good contact, who's interested in a particular issue so that we can set up meetings that matter. And they also uh, pay a lot of attention to the legislation that's introduced and call through that and rise up to me things that you know, are of particular interest to us so that we can decide what action we might wanna take on them. I would have no um, time to read all the thousands of bills that are introduced in the houses and make sense of them and then know how to take action and do the other parts of my job. So we're so incredibly grateful to Michael and Aaron's work as 
being critical links for us with the um, with the state legislature and the state agencies. So I'd love to turn it to Erin so she can talk with you about the state budget. Thank you, Denise. And we really enjoy working with the council and appreciate and value your leadership. And then people will also be seeing Michael during the Q&A. Um, but so as Denise was saying, the 2021-22 legislative session has now adjourned. Um, and as she said, that means that all bills, literally the thousands of bills that were introduced are now dead and will need to be reintroduced next session. So we're really hoping for Steve's law and their registry for children to be reintroduced. Um, so you might be wondering, what are my lawmakers doing if the session is adjourned and all of the bills are dead? Well, there still is some action taking place in the state capitol. Um, just because session is over doesn't mean that committees can't meet. So there's actually a hearing this week, Thursday, I believe, on medical marijuana taking place in the capitol. The legislature also does these things called legislative council study committees during the interim, um, and they're kind of tasked with delving into public policy issues and coming up for rec coming up with recommendations for legislation to consider during the next session. So this year, there's six committees related to occupational licensing, death reporting. Um, some educational things. Um, so that will be taking place during the interim. And then there's two other big things happening. Um, the, the first of which, as Denise mentioned, is the 2022 midterm election. So again, while there is some action still taking place in the Capitol, a lot of lawmakers have gone home to their districts and have hit the campaign trails. Last Friday was the first day that candidates could start circulating nomination papers to get on the ballot for the November 2022 election. So a lot of people are probably going to be out and about in your community. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to start advocating to people as you see them on the campaign trail. So it is a big election year with the midterm elections. We have um, in Wisconsin a very competitive U.S. Senate race. Senator Ron Johnson is running for a third term. There's a very crowded field of Democratic candidates looking for the chance to take him on in November. That includes, um, you may have seen some TV ads already, Alex Lazary, a Milwaukee County Bucks executive is running. He's on TV. Uh, the state current state treasurer, Sarah Godlewski, is running ads. And I don't know if he has an ad yet, but um, our current Lieutenant Governor, Mandela Barnes, is also in the race. So you'll be hearing a lot about U.S. Senate. Uh, all of our congressional representatives are up for re-election. Big news, Senate, or Representative Ron Kine is, is not running for re-election. Uh, Governor Evers is up for re-election. He's running for a second term. There is a very crowded Republican primary shaping up in that race. That includes former Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish, um, State Representative Tim Rantham, and um, former U.S. Senate candidate Kevin Nicholson. And then kind of a quirky thing that's happening, no matter what takes place in the governor's race, we will be getting a new lieutenant governor. Um, and that is because, as I mentioned, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes is running for U.S. Senate. So even if Governor Evers is reelected, uh, we will be getting a new lieutenant governor. Uh, and then every on the kind of state level that Denise outlined, every member of the state assembly is up for re-election and state senators from odd numbered districts are up for re-election. So in addition to those two competitive races for US Senate and governor that I mentioned, there's actually a lot of open seats in the legislature. And since we gave this presentation this morning, and since then there's already been a new, an additional retirement uh, so this afternoon, Representative Jonathan Brostoff, a Democrat from Milwaukee, announced that he is not running. Um, so as of right now, and it, I guess it could change while I am speaking, but um, in the State Assembly, there are 23 open seats out of 99 uh, Assembly seats. And in the Senate, there are six open seats out of the 17 seats that are up um, this election cycle. So that's 29 members of the legislature will not be returning next session. It is, I believe with Representative Brostoff's announcement, we've now have tied the record of people not seeking reelection. So chances are you might be getting a new state representative or state 
senator next session. So it's a great time to start looking into those races and researching candidates. One of the people who's not running for re-election who Denise mentioned is Senator Kathy Bernier, a Republican from the Chippewa Falls area. She is um, a really great advocate for voting and was very um, instrumental in trying to protect the rights of voters with disabilities. And then the second item, I know that was a lot on the election, I'm sorry. The second item is the state budget bill, which that is the vast majority of what we're going to be talking about. Okay, so the state budget bill is probably one of the most important pieces of public policy passed by our legislature every session. Um, and as Jane said, we have a two year legislative session and our budget covers two years. Um, and it's actually the only bill that has to pass every session. So it is a, an $89 billion plan that funds a lot, basically every facet of our state. So it is not hyperbole to say that the state budget impacts each and every one of us. So for the council's priorities, um, the state budget funds mass transit, it funds DVR services, it funds services for the Office of Blind and Visually Impaired and DHS, education funding, special education funding, election administration, and a lot more. So really you can think about the budget um, it impacts the, our roads that we drive on, the schools that we go to or send our kids uh, to. It impacts our water, um, our natural resources. Really, it impacts each and every one of us every day. So the state budget timeline, as I said, is a two-year budget. Uh, so we're at the start of a very long process. So I'll talk through the timeline a bit. Um, so we're having advocacy days at the perfect time this year. We're right at the beginning of the budget process. So right now, between April and August, the state agencies, so the Department of Health Services, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Workforce Development, and the governor's office are already working on their budget proposals, so the items they want to see in the budget bill. And state agencies actually have a deadline of when they need to send their budget request to the governor. So agencies have to get their budget request to the governor by September 15th of 2022. And just important to note that the governor is not required to accept what the agency has put forward. They are simply recommendations. So the governor can accept them or he can ignore them. Um, but it is always interesting when these requests come out because it helps you understand what the agencies view as their priority areas um, going into the next budget cycle. So like Denise said, in the Department of Health Services budget, OBVI funding has not increased in over a decade. Um, so it would be really nice if we saw a request to increase <laughs> OBVI, OBVI funding in the DHS budget request that comes out in September. Once those agency budget requests are out, the governor um, and the Department of Administration begin working on the budget bill. So that takes up a lot of the time from October. Um, so it'll be October, 2022 until January of 2023, if you can believe it. Um, and during this time, the governor does a great job of reaching out to stakeholders. Um, people really spend a lot of time advocating the governor's office about things they would like to see in the state budget bill. And then Governor Evers, um, for his two state budgets that he has introduced, has held public listening sessions in December of every year to get input from people in Wisconsin about what they would like to see in his budget. So if Governor Evers is reelected in November, expect to have an opportunity for public input in December of 2022. Then once the governor uh, has gathered all of his input, from the public and crafted his budget bill. It is officially introduced um, in January or February of the odd numbered year, so 2023. And once the bill is introduced, it's referred to the legislature's Joint Finance Committee, a very powerful 16 member committee that's referred to as the Budget Writing Committee. So they do the bulk of the work on the budget bill after it's introduced by the governor. So once the Joint Finance Committee gets the budget, one of the first things that they do is they start to solicit input on the budget bill. So from March to April, they'll invite state agency leaders in. So if they want to get feedback from the Department of Health Services on something that the governor included in the budget bill, they could invite the DHS secretary, Karen Timberlake, in to come talk to them about it. 
But then they also do what's called the Roadshow, which is a series of public hearings. So anywhere typically between four hearings as up to as high as six hearings, they hold around the state of Wisconsin. So it's a great opportunity for people who may, might have trouble making it to Madison. Um, they typically hold hearings in the Milwaukee area, usually something around La Crosse. They always try and get to Northern Wisconsin, a few other locations. So it's a great opportunity if it's hard for you to come to Madison to have, um, have an opportunity to testify at a public hearing on the state budget bill. Everyone gets about two minutes to speak. And these hearings really do make a difference. Um, I know sometimes it's people feel like their voice doesn't matter, but in this situation, it absolutely does matter. Every budget cycle, um, across the public hearings that are held, there's about two or three hot topics um, that emerge. So things that are brought up at every one of the public hearings. And so the Joint Finance Committee, they really take notice of those. So whatever is emerging as a hot topic. And so that could be people asking for something to get removed from the budget. So a few budgets ago, there was a proposal to completely overhaul our state's long-term care system, family care and IRIS. Um, people who use long-term care flooded the public hearings. It was far and away the number one thing that the finance committee heard about at these hearings. They did not ultimately remove the item from the budget, but they modified it significantly to the point that it ended up becoming non-viable and died outside of the budget process. So finance, they can take things out, if, or modify things drastically if people aren't happy. Or the flip side is, if people want to see something added to the budget that was not included, they can come show up at the hearings and flood the hearings. And that's been happening the last few budgets with the issue of caregiving. We have a caregiver shortage in our state um, and caregiving advocates and providers have been very organized I would say they've been kind of one of the top two to three issues every budget cycle, the last three budgets. And as a result, the last three budgets in a row, the Joint Finance Committee has added more money to caregiving after the hearing. So they've gone above what the governor has proposed because it's something they've heard a lot about at the hearing. So they really do matter and they can change the budget. Um, so once that wraps up, the Joint Finance Committee, they head back to the Capitol in Madison, and they spend the next few months from April, April to June uh, working on the budget, and they literally break it down agency by agency. So the, they might start with a kind of a smaller agency, um, like the, like there's the Riverway Agency, and usually the Board on Aging and Long-Term Care comes up soon. And then they hold kind of the bigger agencies towards the end, agencies where there's a lot of spending. So Department of Health Services has a very large budget because of Medicaid. The Department of Transportation has a very large budget. Those things kind of come up at the end. And the Finance Committee, they can add, modify, or remove anything from the governor's budget bill. So the Finance Committee, they really are the budget writing committee. They make the bill their own. So then once the Finance Committee is done remaking the bill, they advance it to the full legislature. And this is a very important point as well. Um, every lawmaker has to take a vote on the budget. So a lot of times people think, oh, my legislator, they're not on the Joint Finance Committee. It's not worth it to talk to them about state budget issues. That's not true. Every single member of the legislature has to vote on the budget bill. And they also do something called um, a budget buddy process. So when the Finance Committee is voting on the budget in April and June, mem members of the legislature who are not on the Finance Committee get assigned a buddy who is on the Finance Committee. And so they can advance proposals to the Finance Committee member they're paired with. So sometimes you can work with a lawmaker who is not on the Finance Committee to get something added to the budget or removed from the budget in finance because of that budget buddy process. So the full legislature typically votes on the budget bill as modified by the Joint Finance Committee in June or July. And then it goes to the governor's desk. So the budget bill, it starts with the governor, it ends with the governor. And the governor has a few options of what he can do. He can sign the bill without any changes. I've been doing this work for 12 years. I've never seen that happen. The thing that is the most common is he can sign the bill, but make partial vetoes. So line item vetoes. Um, the Wisconsin governor actually has one of the most powerful veto pens in the country. Um, and so they can make these line item vetoes where they can go through and literally cross out 
individual words or maybe strike off a zero and really remake the bill a little bit on their own. That is typically what is done. Um, and then the third option, which again, I've been doing this for 12 years, I've never seen this option either, is the governor could veto the bill in full and send it back to the legislature. Um, again, this is has never happened, but it has been threatened the last couple of budgets because we do have divided government um, with a Democrat governor and a Republican legislature. So the governor, Governor Evers has kind of threatened or alluded to maybe vetoing the full budget bill um, as a warning to the finance, finance committee not to make too many changes to the budget. And then there is technically a statutory deadline to sign the budget bill into law, that is June 30th. However, there is no, there are no consequences to missing this deadline. Um, we're not like the federal government. We do not shut down if we don't have a budget bill. Spending will continue at current levels until we get a new budget in place. As a result, it is very rare that the budget gets signed by June 30th. It's typically signed into law in July. There have been cases where it's gone until September or even October. So that's generally the time frame that we are looking at. And the big question going into this budget cycle is the fact that the governor is up for re-election. So right now, we don't know who is going to be introducing the next budget bill. Governor Evers is, as I said in the beginning, he's already working with his agency is to think about what he wants in the budget bill. He has to do that um, because once you're re-elected, one of the first things you have to do is get your budget bill in place. So he's continuing on like business as usual, as he should. Um, but there is, you know, if he does not win re-election, as we talked about, there is a competitive Republican primary in this race with former Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish, a former U.S. Senate candidate, Kevin Nicholson, and State Representative Timothy Rantham. They will have to face, the three of them will face off in a primary in August. The winner of that primary will become the Republican candidate for governor and take on Governor Evers in November. Um, so if whoever the Republican candidate is wins and, and beats Governor Evers, they will have to hit the ground running right away um, and work to very quickly introduce that budget bill in January or February after being introduced in November. Um, so that's why it's really important to talk to candidates on the campaign trail um, to kind of talk to them about budget issues because if they win, they have to very quickly get a very large spending plan in place. All right, just going to talk very briefly about the Joint Finance Committee. As I said, this is the legislature's budget writing committee. It's made up of 16 members, eight members from the state assembly, eight members from the state senate. Committee makeup is determined by which party is in the legislative majority. Um, so since Republicans control, have strong legislative majorities in both the assembly and senate, there are currently 12 Republican members of the committee and four Democratic members. Um, and because there are so many members of the legislature not running for re-election, like I said before, I think we're up to 29 lawmakers will not be returning to the Capitol next session. As of right now, we know for sure there'll be at least four new members of the Joint Finance Committee next session. Um, so again, really important to talk to your lawmaker, um, even if they're not on the Finance Committee now, they could end up on the Finance Committee next session. These are the current co-chairs, uh, Senator Howard Markline, a Republican from Spring Green, and Representative Mark Bourne, a Republican from the Beaver Dam area. Either of these men is your state legislator. They are super important. And please, uh, if you haven't, please introduce yourself and start talking to them about issues that matter to you. Again, the Finance Committee is very powerful. They can add, remove, or modify the budget in any way. All right, so how you can impact the process. First and foremost, right now, it is election season. People are on the campaign trail. So ask candidates where they stand as you run into them. We talked about the governor's race, but again, every member of the state assembly and state senators from odd numbered districts are up for re-election. They do play a role in the budget process. So make sure you're asking them about budget priorities and talking to them about the things you care about. Um, and also, as Denise mentioned, we're trying to get Steve's law and the registry bill reintroduced and hopefully passed next, sec next session. It's great to talk to candidates about those two issues as well. Second item, attend one of those public hearings on the state budget bill that will be happening in March or April. We will let you know when they are scheduled. And again, if Governor Evers is reelected, look for some type of public listening session with the governor on the budget bill in December. 
And then the third option is, again, just keep in contact with your state senator and your state representative, reach out to them about issues you care about. Even if they're not on the Joint Finance Committee, every single legislature, legislator has to take a vote on the budget. All right, so how you can communicate your ask, some things to keep in mind as you're talking to your lawmakers. You really wanna make sure you're covering your elevator pitch. So letting them know who you are, what's your issue, why does your issue matter? And what's your ask? What do you want them to do about it? Um, so just to talk through an example of that, you could say, hi, I'm Jane Smith. I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm someone who is visually impaired. What's your issue? I rely on public transit, um, but due to underfunding, there are not enough routes, uh, which is creating serious access issues and impacting my ability to get to work. Why does it matter? It's preventing me from joining the workforce um, or to work as much as I want. And lack of transit is directly impacted to our state's workforce crisis, which we're all trying to solve. And then what's your ask? Please, please address transit issues in the next state budget by increasing funding for mass transit so non-drivers can get to work. Um, and then as Denise mentioned, we do, the council has um, a bunch of really nice legislative priorities with our budget asks. So be, uh, be sure to refer back to those legislative priority documents as your guide. And then connecting your story to your ask. Candidates and lawmakers, they wanna hear from real people. They want real examples. They don't always like hearing from lobbyists or trust what lobbyists have to say. So it's super important that you talk to your lawmakers about your own lived experiences. So again, sharing stories and examples that can show why your ask is important. So talking through challenges or barriers with transit. Denise mentioned the earlier the issue about how our transit system is woefully disconnected. So talk through what that looks like. Importance of vision rehabilitation services. What are the consequences if you can't get access to those services? Experiences with DVR. Again, our state has a huge workforce crisis right now. Employers are struggling to find workers. So talk through your experience with DVR. If there are barriers to DVR that could be fixed, um, great time to bring those up. And then just some examples here real quickly about types of questions you can ask candidates when you see them out on the campaign trail. And again, the same strategy here, trying to connect your story to your ask. Um, so you could go up to a, law, a, a candidate for office and say, it would take me a full day to get to Madison using public transit. What is your plan to improve transit services in Wisconsin? Um, if you've had issues with OB, OBVI, you could say I've had to wait months before seeing a vision services provider through OBVI. How will you ensure that people who are visually impaired have access to the services they need? So again, um, trying to educate as well as advocate as you engage with candidates and lawmakers. And with that, I will turn it back over to Denise to talk about being an advocate. All right, thanks so much, Erin, that was awesome. So um, oftentimes folks ask me, well, how do I do this? Because it just seems really daunting. And I think if we kind of break it down into that we have two primary jobs as advocates, one is to educate and the other is to advocate. So uh, lawmakers, whether they're on the local level or the state or even the federal level, they deal with so many things. I mean, just remember that the uh, state assembly introduced you know, almost 1,200 bills. That's a lot. And they're ranging from everything from you know, PFAS in our groundwater to the registry, to things related to transportation. You know, they're all over the map. And so legislators end up knowing a little about a lot of things. And I know sometimes folks when they're, uh, they have met with a uh, lawmaker feel really discouraged because the lawmaker didn't know our issues. That's actually awesome because you're in the seat then of helping that lawmaker to understand, um, to really paint a picture for them, to walk them through what is it like for you to try to do the things, the very things that you want to do. I remember talking with a lawmaker once and he, he and I both had college age kids at that point. And um, I was talking about how it would take me three days to get to Ashland from Madison if I needed to use public transit. I'd either have to go up through the Twin Cities and Duluth and over or up 
go over to Milwaukee, to Green Bay, to Escanaba, and then down to Ashland. And it would involve sleeping on a bus, which, you know, really does not sound fun. And he was just slack jawed because he had never had to think about that experience that if he wanted to go see his kid, he could hop in the car and be there to see the kid in a matter of a couple of hours. So it really opened the door to some very powerful um, conversations and good working relationship with this particular legislator. So we have important stories to tell that give concrete real life examples to policymakers. And so please use that opportunity to help educate them. And then we need to let them know what would make a difference to advocate. So frequently I'll hear from policymakers and I'm actually a policymaker myself. I sit on the city of Madison's transportation commission. And so when we hear public testimony and the folks do a great job of telling their story but they don't tell us concretely what would make things better for them. We don't, we, we, we don't know then. We don't know what would make this better. And then we're kind of playing a guessing game based on our own knowledge. So when, after you tell your story, then have that concrete ask, what is it that would make this better for me? And that's where those advocacy documents that we've been referencing will come in handy because they give lawmakers biteable bites, something they could actually do and achieve. So, you know, we need cross municipal transportation in this state desperately so we can get from one town to another. But if we just said, said that to a lawmaker, they might not know what to do with that. But if we gave them something much more concrete, like do a pilot program of um, you know, uh, a bus system that runs from towns, uh, between towns in a particular region, do it as a pilot, do it as a partnership with businesses. It gives them something much more concrete to chew on. So educate and advocate, and we can go forward. Um, when we uh, have these conversations, whether they're formal ones in the state capitol or in the lawmaker's office, or when we might be meeting them um, at a town hall or in another situation, there are some really key uh, things to keep in mind. And this uh, is in a much longer article that we published last week. It came out on Monday yeah, on our advocacy e-news. And if you're not signed up for that advocacy e-news, I'd highly um, recommend, suggest that you get yourself signed up. You can either do that on your own on our website, or you can reach out to us at info at wcblind.org and ask to be signed up. So I'll just hit the main points of that article to really make the most of your um, conversation with the legislator. So you wanna really know your subject and your audience. So oftentimes telling your story is perfect subject matter. Um, and then know something about the lawmaker that you're gonna be talking with. You know, know what things are important to them, where they stand on things, wh what work they've been doing in a particular area. Because if you spend the whole time trying to convince them that transportation is a problem and they already are on board with that, then you've kind of wasted that time. So um, you can learn about the things that are important to your lawmaker on their websites, um, on their social media pages, by listening to them at town halls, by paying attention to their commercials. We will get inundated this um, summer and fall with information on the candidates. Um, Vote 411 that's put out by the League of Women Voters is also an excellent forum for learning more about your lawmaker and the candidates uh, where they stand on things. So do your homework before that visit. Figure out um, what, you, what your outcome is. What do you want to achieve during this particular meeting? And sometimes it might just be an education opportunity. There have been times when I have met um, with lawmakers, for example, with Kathy Bernier, just to have an initial meeting to help her understand that we do not have an accessible absentee ballot in this state. So any of us who can't see the ballot can't vote the ballot. We have to have somebody read it to us and trust that they're marking it 
according to our wishes. She had no idea and she is a disability voting advocate. So it was purely an information and a learning conversation. And then we started to talk about, you know, what might be the actions. So that's an important outcome um, as well as maybe a direct ask. Tell your story grounded in factual information. There's no need to over-dramatize. Our stories are rich and important on their own. No need for uh, tons and tons of details, many, many examples. Pick one or two examples that really speak to the point. Too many examples and you will lose your legislator. They're just not gonna pay attention because they're getting overwhelmed. And, um, and make sure that you are being accurate in that story. And then lastly, listen, learn, and respond. Legislators um, have, uh, they're human beings. And you know I, I say this because I've seen lawmakers, both school board members and some of our municipal clerks and sometimes state um, and local officials, we are in a time that is very upsetting to me because we are treating each other inhumanely on a regular basis. So I have seen people yell at lawmakers and even threaten their lives. So we, when we show up for these meetings, we, I want to invite us to show up and be the way that we would want to be treated. So that means listening to the lawmaker. They often have really powerful stories to tell. I met with uh, our senator recently and uh, my own senator recently and learned that she has a grandmother with macular degeneration. And that was so important for me to know because it became a bridge between the two of us that we could use for deepening our conversation learn from them. They will share things with you about the, the legislative process or about some of the barriers that they're facing in moving something forward that will really help you and us understand you know, how we might need to switch strategy and respond to their questions. If you don't know the answer to a question, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't make something up. You know, Always share the truth with the legislator. And if you don't know it in the moment, you can let them know that, you know, it's perfectly okay to say, you know, I'm not sure about that. Let me look into it and I'll get back to you and then follow up, you know, either contact us or another advocacy agency, you know, do a little bit of research and then follow up with that legislator. Legislative relationships are built over time. They're not a one and done thing. And when you treat that legislator with a lot of respect and you follow up, answering their questions, follow up with a thank you. You're putting deposits in the emotional bank account. And then the next time you come to that legislator to ask for something, then you know, you've know you got a positive history with them. Um, we can go forward. So there are so many ways to meet with your um, lawmakers on the local level, on the state level. And one of course is the in-office meetings in the state capitol. And I know some folks love that. It's like totally exciting to meet with a legislator at that big wooden desk and you know navigating through the Capitol and it feels great and, and that's awesome. And for others of you, it's like, oh my gosh, that's totally intimidating. That building in itself is horrific to navigate for sighted folks, let alone those of us with vision impairment. I don't wanna to go to Madison and do that. I don't wanna try, you know, have my driver go around the Capitol Square trying to find a place to park. You know, there's a lot to it. So in-office meetings are only one way of connecting with your legislator. Um, email, phone calls, always um, a great tool. Well, because legislators are going to be in district a lot, because of campaigns, this is a great opportunity to meet them on neutral ground. And um, you know, go to a coffee, invite them to a coffee shop uh, with you or a public park or the public library for a meeting. I was just um, talking with a, a young advocate not too long ago who set up a meeting with her senator in a local coffee shop. And he suggested a place and because she is a wheelchair user, there wasn't, that wasn't a good place for her to get in. It was not uh, wheelchair accessible. 
So she used that as an opportunity to educate and to say, you know, this is an issue. I can't get into this place. How about if we go to this place instead? So even that very notion of setting up the meeting, there are times that I've said to a lawmaker, policymaker, um, you know, it's not that's that neighborhood is the streets are not well um, signaled and it's very difficult and challenging and unsafe for me to walk in that neighborhood and cross streets safely. How about if we meet here instead, because I know that I can navigate and get there safely. So even setting up that neutral place meeting can be a great learning opportunity for you um, with the legislator. And then meeting in some place like a coffee shop or a public library, it's neutral ground. You know, you're kind of both on more equal footing. Extended invitation to, you know, a group that you're in. Several of you might be in low vision support groups, you might be in Lions Clubs, um, you might um, go to your senior center for lunch, et cetera. Because again, it's campaign season, lawmakers are gonna love an opportunity to um, get in front of a group. So extend that inv invitation. You know, Our Lions Club is really interested in X issue. Would you come and speak with us um, about that? And then it, they be, have an opportunity to listen to you all about issues of concern. Um, go to things like forums and town halls. There'll be a lot of them this summer and fall um, because the candidates are running. So sometimes the candidates will um, sponsor those. Sometimes there'll be um, nonprofits or other organizations that sponsor a panel on the school board candidates or the folks running for your county supervisor seat or even your state legislature. Go to those when you can, um, when you can arrange transportation to get there because they are rich environments for listening and learning and a great environment for asking a question. And then go do something fun with your legislator. So what I mean by that is there are many legislators who have never been on public transportation, whether it's a city bus, whether it's paratransit, whether it is dial a ride um, and um, or the, the van pool from your senior center, inviting them to go with you as you go about your activities is so enlightening because they're used to just jumping in their car and getting from A to B um, with a lot of ease and don't realize that it takes longer, that there's more stops, that you might not get there directly, that you have to walk you know, a certain distance. So that can be a, a, just a, a, a tremendous experience for uh, lawmakers or invite them to go on a walk audit with you. So you know, ask them to walk with you the route that you take to the grocery store or the route that you take to work um, because um, again, they'll get a, a, a real person view of what it's like to try to cross unsignalized streets or walk down um, areas that don't have sidewalks. So really creativity um, and the imagination is the limit here. And oftentimes legislators love that. Sometimes it's a photo opportunity for them that they can use in their campaign or on their website. So why not give it to them and use it as an educational opportunity? and we can go forward. Um, advocacy across the spectrum matters. So um, oftentimes I think we can get really fixated on thinking that it's most important to talk to our federal folks or our state folks, and we can forget about the importance of talking to our local folks and, talk, and about the importance of personal advocacy. All of that matters. So personal advocacy is a great opportunity to really grow your advocacy chops. And as people living with vision impairment, we will need to be our own best advocates for our entire lives, exclamation point. It happens to me regularly that I need to be my own best advocate. Recently, I was dealing with my health insurance. They had denied um, uh, um, a service that I was seeking. So I needed to appeal the denial. I went to the website for the insurer and the appeal form was not screen reader accessible. It was a thing where I would have had to print it and fill it out with handwriting, which is not going to happen. You know, that's, that's an impossible task for me. So I sent an email to them and said, you know, I would like to file the appeal. However, this form is not accessible. 
and I have the right to be able to file it privately and independently and to not have to have somebody fill it out for me on my behalf, please make the form accessible. Within a week, I got a, a call that uh, from, from the pers from a person in their customer care um, who said, you know, we're so grateful that you brought this to our attention. None of our forms are accessible. And so we are working to make them all screen reader and fill up, screen reader accessible and fillable. And we did the appeal form for you first. It's attached here on this email. It will also be on our website. I've gone in and checked and all of my insurance company's forms are now screen reader accessible. So not only does that benefit me, but it benefits you know, hundreds of other people as well. So that personal advocacy matters. Our local and regional decision makers, so our county board uh, supervisors, our um, town chair people, our mayors, our city council members, our town board members, they all make a difference. They're making critical decisions about our lives every day, about where affordable housing is located in our communities, about um, the rules and regulations for public health, about um, what dollars, local dollars go into transportation, um, about what happens in our schools. So do not ignore them. You know, often really uh, positive action can be taken locally a lot faster than it can happen on a state level. So please, please, please build relationships with your local folks. And then of course, state and national. All right, and we can go to the next slide. So very last thing that I um, want to uh, mention, I think I have two things to mention and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, if you do not know who your legislator is, no worries, you can find that out. You know, many of us do know, but some of us are like, I don't know. There, you know, there'll be redistricting that's happening. So um, it is great to get that information from one of two sources. One is the legislative hotline. Kathleen, I just heard her put that phone number in the chat. I'm going to say it out loud to you, and we will also send you um, the PowerPoint slides at some point, so you'll have it there as well. But the legislative hotline, when you give them your street address, um, they can tell you who your senator is and who your assembly representative is. They can give you the email for them, the phone number for them, and the postal mailing address for them, whatever information you would like and you get to talk to a human being. That phone number is 800-362-9472, 800-362-9472. The state legislature also has a web page where you can enter your um, street address and it will bring up that information about your um, legislators. However, the state of Wisconsin, legislature's page is horribly inaccessible and I do not um, you know underemphasize the word horrible. I have I have a lot of trouble navigating it and I'm a really competent screen reader user. So um, and it's an it's an advocacy issue we are currently working on because people need to have access to their government. So if you find that website challenging to use, um, please use the legislative hotline number. And last slide. So um, I think Aaron has certainly hit this point several times. I'm gonna emphasize it here. We have two more elections in 2022. We have a primary in August for a lot of these highly contested races. And then we have a general election in November, which includes our state, our, our US Senator, our governor, our Lieutenant governor, and many, many legislators at the state level and many, many local officials. Please vote. It is one of the most fundamental advocacy actions we can take. The rest of it in some ways doesn't matter. You know, if you are advocating and advocating, but you did not vote, 
you know, a legislator may ask you the question, well, did you vote? They don't even care if you voted for them, but they may ask, did you vote? And if you say no, it's going to be challenging for them to really put the energy and the time into listening. So it is one of our most important rights and responsibilities to vote in every election, even though I know it's challenging to get to the polls because of transportation or to access that ballot, please figure out how you can make it happen in your life and who the resource people are that can help you get you know, exercise your right to vote. Justin Dart um, is one of my personal heroes. He's a disability advocate who really was fundamental in the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And he often said, vote as if your life depends on it because it does. So with that, um, I wanna thank you so much. And we have, um, the, ability, the uh, opportunity to um, take questions at this time. Here's our contact information. Again, you'll be getting that um, in our emails, but please always feel free to reach out. But let's go ahead and stop the screen share and um, open it up to questions. I know that Lori from our staff will share the questions that have come up in the chat. I believe that Michael Blumenfeld, yep, has joined us. So he's also here to um, do questions. So Lori, if you read a question, I can figure out how to, um, how to shepherd it along to one of the three of us. Sounds good. Thank you, Denise. So I've listened in and, and tell me, what, what difference does advocacy really make? Well, I'll start with a, an example. And then I think Michael or Aaron, I'd love for you to share one as well. Advocacy matters because, and even when it takes time for change to happen, being persistent makes a difference. So uh, several years ago, during the Walker administration, we went to the, um, the transportation, the Department of Transportation secretary at that time, and we asked for an interagency com committee that would really look at trying to figure out the, the problems that we have in Wisconsin with transportation. We knew that if we got several people together, agencies together, advocates together, that we, that we could put our heads together and try to figure out how to solve this very perplexing um, issue. The secretary at that time was kind of like, oh, that's nice, but not really super very interested. They were interested in white cane issues. So we worked on that with them. And then we went back again the next year, brought it back up again, didn't get terribly far, got a little further on some white cane issues, kind of a, what I would call lower hanging fruit. And then we, um, we had an election, Governor Evers became governor, there was a new transportation secretary. We went to Craig Thompson and said, we have this idea and um, here's what we think. And uh, we had also been working with other advocacy groups that represent aging groups and other disabilities. They were also going to the secretary with that same ask and our voices united. The secretary said, this is a marvelous idea. He has said to me many times, I'm, I'm glad we were smart enough to listen to you. Um, they formed the Wisconsin uh, Non-Driver Advisory Committee, which is in its second year. Um, I was appointed as a co-chair along with one of my other fellow advocates colleagues. And that committee is making some, you know, some pretty significant and powerful inroads um, that will eventually lead to better transportation access for the people of Wisconsin. So advocacy matters and persistence um, is vital. So Aaron or Michael, would you like to share um, why advocacy matters? I'll go, Michael, or Michael, go ahead. I thought you had an example that you. I do, I'll assume my one example, I'll reiterate the example I gave um, when I was talking about the budget public hearings. So for over a decade, I worked on caregiving issues and there had not been an increase to the Medicaid reimbursement rate for personal care, which helps pay wages for caregivers. Um, and as, as I said, Luckily, people got really engaged on this issue about three budgets ago, and they started really showing up at the public hearings on the state budget. 
And now after like more than a decade of having a flat rate, the last three budgets have included historic investments in caregiving. Um, so again, it really does matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would just and it briefly, takes time too. Yes, I would just briefly add the budget example because so many of the issues we care about are in the state budget. And every time uh, it's a two year cycle, the joint finance committee have public hearings. And so Aaron gave one example that because the, the groups came out and spoke at the public hearing, it really elevated the issue. And I can tell you every budget, and I've, I've worked on a few of them, there's always one or two issues that come out of nowhere just because people showed up. And so legislators say there's no money or they can't deal with certain things, but uh, they do respond to people coming and talking, getting media coverage and, um, and hearing those stories. So. I think the, the budget process is a, is a good example where things can happen or change just because people get engaged. Michael and Aaron, thanks. Those are great examples. Sorry, I think we have time for probably one more, maybe two more questions. Okay. Um, thank you all. Um, during uh, one of our attendees asked for some tips for overcoming how nervous he gets uh, when thinking about speaking with the legislator. Um, he has a hard time remembering facts and figures. Any any hints for him? Sure. Um, let's see. Um, Michael, you want to kick us off? Just we have a change of voice. Sure. Um, what I always tell, I mean, all, all the folks we work with is that you are the expert. Uh, legislators have to kind of know a little about a lot. And, you know, you have a few that maybe they're... Um, they're in business or they're a realtor or a farmer and they, you know, they have that expertise, but uh, for the most part, you're, you're the expert. And, and it's really about talking about yourself and your challenges or um, your lived experience. And, and that's what they wanna hear. The facts and figures, you know, there's us and there's the council and, and certainly we always try to be helpful with talking points for those kind of facts and figures, but what really is impactful is just hearing about, um, as a constituent, what your concerns are. And then the other thing, and, and Denise always puts it really well, I mean, uh, you know, they, I, I think she says they, they, legislators put their pants on like everybody else, one leg at a time. And, and to remember, these are, um, you know, people that are, um, you know, in your community. One other thing I would just say is that oftentimes people don't always really even know who they know or how they know them. Um, you know, a legislator could be a neighbor or someone who goes to church or their kids are in the school uh, with your kids, that type of thing. So to kind of think about, you know, with some, sometimes in the community, you already kind of know them or know, know family members, which also kind of helps, I think, bring down, down those barriers. One of the things too is we don't have to stuff our heads with all sorts of facts and figures because I don't, I mean, I don't remember a ton of facts and figures. It's, it's a lot to hold. So just pick one data point that really speaks to and um, elevates your issue. So uh, when I'm meeting with legislators and I'm talking about transportation and I'm telling them my story and the stories of other folks who you know, really struggle to get from here to there, I will back that up with this a, a data point that nearly 30% of Wisconsinites are people who um, are not drivers. And the, the legislators are pretty shocked by that because they think that the, not, the people who are not driving are a very small group of people. And when they realize it's one third of um, the, the state's people, that gets their attention. And that's the only fact that I need along with the stories to, to, really, um, to really accentuate. Lori, let's do one more question. And we have one from one of our attendees says he lives in a, a rural county and every time he calls a federal or state lawmaker, he either gets a voicemail or he gets to speak to a legislative aide. Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, uh, is that a, an effective way to to reach your legislator or and, and to just remind everyone to how to find out who your legislators are, please. Cool. Erin, you want to kick that one off? Yeah, so I would say it's definitely disappointing sometimes if you get a voicemail, um, but someone in the office will eventually 
listen to that voicemail, especially like it is tends to be tougher um, to get in hold, get a hold of federal lawmakers easier on the state level a little mm-hmm. bit, but someone will listen to your voicemail. And then um, you mentioned talking to a legislative aide, never be discouraged um, by talking to a legislative aide. It really is the same as talking to a lawmaker. I always joke that the state and federal government are run by a bunch of highly motivated 27 year olds. <laughs> um, so a legislative aide is just a view them the same as a lawmaker. Um, they're the ones that are briefing lawmakers on phone calls and meetings. So they are just as important. I don't know if, if Michael or Denise has anything else to add. No, I think that really, that really hit it. So I know we have some additional questions and um, if we can capture those from the chat, what we could do is when we send out um, you know, the PowerPoint and communications, we could respond to those questions as well. Um, it was just uh, short answers and I'm happy to take a lead on that. So um, I wanna remind everybody that we have two more sessions that um, you should have gotten the links for. One is tomorrow. At noon, that will be with our guest will be um, Deputy Secretary for the Department of uh, Health Services, T.R. Williams, and we will be speaking with T.R. about OBVI and other health related um, advocacy priorities. Um, And then on Thursday, we'll be speaking with someone from the Department of Administration about the accessibility of state websites. We'll do those as meeting um, format. So you'll be in the meeting with us rather than the webinar, um, because they're a little less um, information dense. And so you'll have the opportunity to unmute your mic um, and uh, raise a question if you would like, um, and or to still put your um, comments and questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing that. And those sessions will each be an hour. So again, if you didn't get the links or you're having trouble um, finding them in your email, just put that info in the chat or in email us at info at wcblind.org and let us know that you need us to send out the link again. So I wanna thank um, Aaron so much for partnering with me to um, share today's content. It was fantastic working with you. Michael, thank you so much for coming on for the um, Q&A, really appreciate that. And then I wanna do a call out to the folks that were behind the scenes who really made um, this uh, webinar work extremely well. So thank you so much to Bob for kicking it off in your welcome and Lori for facilitating the questions. And then Mitch for running all of the IT to make this work. Um, it's, there's many buttons to push and they have to be pushed at the right time. So thank you so much. And then to Kathleen, who has been um, helping you all register, been sending out communications, is on the public side of the webinar right now, making sure it's all working for what you're all experiencing. It takes a village to make Advocacy Day happen. And I'm very grateful to all of you for that. So good night, everybody. Go enjoy some delicious dinner and looking forward to connecting with you tomorrow.